Section One of the World's Famous Orations, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schampf. The World's Famous Orations, Volume Three. His Sermon on All Saints by Saint Bede, about 1710. Footnote. Translated by the Rev. John M. Neal, abridged. More than thirty editions of Bede's writings have been published. The one which appeared in 1843, edited by Dr. J. A. Giles, and giving in complete form the original Latin, with translations of the historical work into English, comprises twelve volumes. End footnote. Born about 673, died in 735 surnamed the venerable ordained a deacon in his nineteenth year a priest in his thirtieth devoted his life to teaching and writing his ecclesiastical history of the english nation is his best known work and one of much importance to early english history today beloved we celebrate in joy one solemnity the festival of all saints in whose companionship the heaven exults in whose guardianship the earth rejoices by whom triumphs the holy church is crowned whose confession as braver in its passion is also brighter in its honour because while the battle increased the glory of them that fought in it was also augmented and the triumph of martyrdom is adorned with the manifold kind of its torments because the more severe the pangs the more illustrious also were the rewards while our mother the catholic church was taught by her head jesus christ not to fear contumely affliction death and more and more strengthened not by resistance but by endurance inspired all that illustrious number who suffered imprisonment or torture with one and equal ardor to fight the battle for triumphal glory o truly blessed mother church so illuminated by the honor of divine condescension so adorned by the glorious blood of triumphant martyrs so decked with the inviolate confession of snow-white virginity among its flowers neither roses nor lilies are wanting endeavor now beloved each for yourselves in each kind of honor to obtain your own dignity crowns snow-white for chastity or purple for passion in those heavenly camps both peace and war have their own flowers wherewith the soldiers of christ are crowned for the ineffable and unbounded goodness of god has provided this also that the time for labor and for agony should not be extended not long not enduring but short and so to speak momentary that in this short and little life should be the pain and the labors that in the life which is eternal should be the crown and the reward of merits that the labors should quickly come to an end but the reward of endurance should remain without end that after the darkness of this world they should behold that most beautiful light and should receive a blessedness greater than the bitterness of all passions as the apostle beareth witness when he saith the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us with how joyous a breast the heavenly city receives those that return from flight how happily she meets them that bear the trophies of the conquered enemy and with triumphant men women also come who rose superior both to this world and to their sex doubling the glory of their welfare virgins with youths who surpass their tender years by their virtues yet not they alone but the rest of the multitude of the faithful shall also enter the palace of that eternal court who in peaceful union have observed the heavenly commandments and have maintained the purity of the faith but above all these things is being associated with the companies of angels and archangels thrones and dominations principalities and powers and the enjoyment of the watches of all the celestial virtues to behold the squadron of the saints adorned with stars the patriarchs glittering with faith the prophets rejoicing in hope the apostles who in the twelve tribes of israel shall judge the whole world the martyrs decked with the purple diadems of victory the virgins also with their wreaths of beauty 
but of the king who is in the midst no words are able to speak that beauty that virtue that glory that magnificent that majesty surpasses every expression every sense of the human mind for it is greater than the glory of all saints but to attain to that ineffable sight and to be made radiant with the splendour of his countenance it were worth while to suffer torment every day it were worth while to endure hell itself for a season so that we might behold christ coming in glory and be joined to the number of the saints so is it not then well worth while to endure earthly sorrows that we may be partakers of such good and of such glory what beloved brethren will be the glory of the righteous what that great gladness of the saints when every face shall shine as the sun when the lord shall begin to count over in distinct orders his people and to receive them into the kingdom of his father and to render to each the rewards promised to their merits and to their works things heavenly for things earthly things eternal for things temporal a great reward for a little labor to introduce the saints to the vision of his father's glory and to make them sit down in heavenly places to the end that god may be all in all and to bestow on them that love him that eternity which he has promised to them that immortality for which he has redeemed them by the quickening of his own blood lastly to restore them to paradise and to open the kingdom of heaven by the faith and verity of his promise let us consider that paradise is our country as well as theirs and so we shall begin to reckon the patriarchs as our fathers why do we not then hasten and run that we may behold our country and salute our parents a great multitude of dear ones is there expecting us a vast and mighty crowd of parents brothers and children secure now of their own safety anxious yet for our salvation long that we may come to their right and embrace them to that joy which will be common to us and to them to that pleasure expected by our fellow-servants as well as ourselves to that full and perpetual felicity if it be a pleasure to go to them let us eagerly and covetously hasten on our way that we may soon be with them and soon be with christ that we may have him as our guide in this journey who is the author of salvation the prince of life the giver of gladness and who liveth and reigneth with god the father almighty and with the holy ghost end of section one section two of the world's famous orations volume three this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arav Akarwal. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. Rules for Decent Living by John Wycliffe. Born in 1324, died in 1384. Master of Balliol College, Oxford, in 1360. Then rector of three parishes successfully a royal ambassador to confer with papal nuncios at bruges in 1374 summoned before convocation in 1373 because of his attacks on the clergy threw off his allegiance to the papacy and wrote ceaselessly against the papal claim made the first complete translation of the bible into english about 1382 his bones exhumed and burnt and the ashes thrown into a river by the order of the synod of constance in 1428 if thou be a lord look thou live a rightful life in thine own person both anent god and man keeping the hests of god doing the works of mercy ruling well thy five wits and doing reason and equity and good conscience to all men the second time govern well thy wife thy children and thy homely men in god's law and suffer no sin among them neither in word nor in deed upon thy might that they might be an example of holiness and righteousness to all other. For thou shalt be damned for their evil life and thine evil sufferance. But if thou amendst it upon thy might. The third time govern well thy tenants, and maintain them in right and reason, and be merciful to them in their rents and worldly merriments, and suffer not only thy officers to do them wrong nor extortions, and chastise them in good manner that he rebel against God's hests and virtuous living more than for rebellion against thine own cause or person. 
and hold with God's cause, and love, reward, praise, and cherish the true and virtuous of life more than if they do only thine own profit and worship, and maintain truly upon thine cunning and might God's law and true preachers thereof, and God's servants in rest and peace. For by this reason thou holdest thy lordship of God, and if thou failest of this, thou forfeitest against God in all thy lordship, in body and soul. Principally, if thou maintainest Antichrist's disciples in their errors against Christ's life and his teaching, for blindness and worldly friendship, and helpest to slander and pursue true men that teach Christ's gospel and his life, and warn the people of their great sins and of false priests and hypocrites that deceive Christian men in a faith and virtuous life, and worldly goods also. If thou be a laborer, live in meekness, and truly and willfully do thy labor. So if thy lord or thy master be a heathen man, that by thy meekness and willful and true service he have not to murmur against thee, nor slander thy God nor Christendom, and serve not Christian lords with murmuring, nor only with their presence, but truly and willfully in their absence, not only for worldly dread nor worldly reward, but for dread of God and of good conscience and for reward in heaven. For that God that putteth thee in such service wots what state is best for thee, and will reward thee more than all earthly lords may, if thou dost do it truly and willfully for his ordinance. And in all things beware of murmuring against God and his visitation, in great labor and long, and great sickness and other adversities, and beware of wrath, of cursing and wearing, or baning of man or of beast. And ever keep patience and meekness and charity both to God and to man. And thus each man in these three states oweth to life, to save himself and help others. And thus should good life, rest, peace, and charity be among Christian men, and they be saved. And heathen men soon be converted, and God magnified greatly in all nations and sects, that now despise him and his law, for the wicked living of false Christian men. End of section two. Recording by Arav Agarwal. Section three of the world's famous orations, volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arav Agarwal. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3, The Second Sermon on the Card, by Latimer. Footnote. Preached at Cambridge in 1529, being one of the two sermons on the card. Latimer's sermons were first collected in 1562, an annotated edition in two volumes, with a memoir by John Watkins, was published in 1824. A complete edition of his writings in two volumes, edited by George E. Corey, was issued by the Parker Society in 1844. Now you have heard what is meant by this first card, and how you ought to play it. I purpose again to deal unto you another card, almost of the same suit, for they be of so nigh affinity that one cannot well be played without the other. The first card declared that you should not kill, which might be done in diverse ways, as being angry with your neighbor, in mind, in countenance, in word, or deed. It declared also how you should subdue the passions of ire, and so clear evermore yourselves from them. And whereas this first card doth kill in you these stubborn turks of ire, this second card will not only they should be mortified in you, but that you yourselves shall cause them to be likewise mortified in your neighbor. If that your said neighbor hath been through your occasion moved unto ire, either in countenance, word, or deed. Now let us hear, therefore, the tenor of this card. When thou makest thine oblation at mine altar, and there dost remember that thy neighbor hath anything against thee, lay down there thine oblation, and go first and reconcile thy neighbor, then come and offer thine oblation. This card was spoken by Christ, as testifieth St. Matthew in his fifth chapter, against all such as do presume to come unto the church to make oblation unto God, either by prayer or any other deed of charity not having their neighbors reconciled, 
Reconciling is as much to say as to restore thy neighbor unto charity, which by thy words or deeds is moved against thee. Then, if so be that, thou hast spoken to or by thy neighbor, whereby he is moved to ire or wrath, thou must lay down thine oblation. Oblations be prayers, alm deeds, or any work of charity. These be all called oblations to God. Lay down, therefore, thine oblation. Begin to do none of these foresaid works before thou goest unto thy neighbor and confesseth thy fault unto him, declaring thy mind that if thou hast offended him, thou art glad and willing to make him amends, as far forth as thy words and substance will extend, requiring him not to take it at the worst. Thou art sorry in thy mind that thou shouldst be occasion of his offending. A true and faithful servant, whensoever his master commandeth him to do anything, he maketh no stops nor questions, but goeth forth with a good mind. And it is not unlike he, continuing in such a good mind and will, shall well overcome all dangers and stops, whatsoever betide him in his journey, and to bring to pass effectually his master's will and pleasure. On the contrary, a slothful servant, when his master commandeth him to do anything, by and by he will ask questions such as, Where? When? Which way? And so forth. And so he putteth everything in doubt, that although both his errand and way be never so plain, yet by his untoward and slothful behavior his master's commandment is either undone quite, or else so done that it shall stand to no good purpose. Go now forth with the good servant, and ask no such questions, and put no doubts. Be not ashamed to do thy master's and lord's will and commandment. Go, as I said, unto thy neighbor that is offended by thee, and reconcile him, as is aforesaid, whom thou hast lost by thine unkind words, by thy scorns, mocks, and other disdainous words and behaviors. And be not nice to ask of him the cause why he is displeased with thee. Require of him charitably to remit, and cease not till you both depart one from the other, true brethren in Christ. Do not, like the slothful servant, thy master's message with cautels and doubts. Come not to thy neighbor whom thou hast offended, and give him a pennyworth of ale, or a banquet, and so make him a fair countenance, thinking that by thy drink or dinner he will show thee like countenance. I grant you, you may both laugh and make good cheer, and yet there may remain a bag of rusty mouse, twenty years old, in thy neighbor's bosom. When he departeth from thee with a good countenance, thou thinkest all is well then. But now, I tell thee, it is worse than it was, for such cloaked charity, where thou dost offend before Christ but once, thou hast offended twice herein, for now thou goest about to give Christ a mock, if he would take it of thee. Thou thinkest to bind thy master Christ's commandment. Beware, do not so, for at length he will overmatch thee and take thee tardy whatsoever thou be. And so, as I said, it should be better for thee not to do his message on this fashion, for it will stand thee in no purpose. What, some will say, I am sure he loveth me well enough, he speaketh fair to my face. Yet for all that thou mayest be deceived, it proveth not true love in a man to speak fair. If he love thee with his mind and heart, he loveth thee with his eyes, with his tongue, with his feet, with his hands and his body, for all these parts of a man's body be obedient to the will and mind. He loveth thee with his eyes, that looketh cheerfully on thee when thou meetest with him, and is glad to see thee prosper and do well. He loveth thee with his tongue, that speaketh well by thee behind thy back, or giveth thee good counsel. He loveth thee with his hands, that will help thee in times of necessity, by giving him some alms deeds, or with any occupation of the hand. He loveth thee with his body, that will labor with his body, or put his body in danger to do good love for thee, or to deliver thee from adversity, and so forth, with the other members of his body. Evermore bestow the greatest part of thy goods in works of mercy, and the less parts in voluntary works. Voluntary works be called all manner of offering in the church, except your four offering days and your tithes. Setting up candles, gilding and painting, building of churches, giving of ornaments, going on pilgrimages, making of highways, and such other be called voluntary works, 
which works be of themselves marvelous good and convenient to be done. Necessary works and works of mercy are called the commandments. The four offering days, your tithes, and such other that belong to the commandments. And works of mercy consist in relieving and visiting thy poor neighbors. Now then, if men be so foolish of themselves, that they will bestow the most part of their goods in voluntary works, which they be not bound to keep, but willingly and by their devotion, and leave the necessary works undone, which they are bound to do, they and all their voluntary works are like to go unto everlasting damnation. And I promise you, if you build a hundred churches, give as much as you can make to the gilding of saints and honoring of the church, and if thou go as many pilgrimages as thy body can well suffer, and offer as great candles as oaks, if thou leave the works of mercy and the commandments undone, these works shall nothing avail thee. No doubt the voluntary works be good and ought to be done, but yet they must be so done, that by their occasion necessary works and the works of mercy not be decayed and forgotten. If you will see a glorious church unto God, see first yourselves be in charity with your neighbors, and not and and suffer not them to be offended by your works. Then, when you came into your parish church, you bring with you the holy temple of God. As St. Paul saith, You yourselves be the very holy temples of God. And Christ saith by his prophet, In you will I rest, and intend to make my mansion an abiding place. Again, if you list to gild and paint Christ in your churches, and honor him in vestments, See that before your eyes the poor people do not die for lack of meat, drink, and clothing. Then to your deck the very true temple of God, and honor him in rich vestures that will never be worn. And so forth use yourselves according to the commandments. And then finally set up your candles, and they will report what a glorious light remaineth in your hearts, for it is not fitting to see a dead man light candles. Then I say, go your pilgrimages, build your material churches, do all your voluntary works, and they will represent you unto God, and testify with you that you have provided him a glorious place in your hearts. But beware, I say again, that you do not run so far in your voluntary works that ye do quite forget your necessary works of mercy, which you are bound to keep. You must have ever a good respect unto the best and worthiest works towards God, to be done first and with more efficacy and the other to be done secondarily. Thus if you do, with the other that I have spoken of before, you may come according to the tenor of your cards, and offer your oblations and prayers to our Lord Jesus Christ, who will both hear and accept them, to your everlasting joy and glory, to which he bring us, and all those whom he suffered death for. Amen. End of section 3. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Rav Agarwal. Section 4 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rav Agarwal. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. On the Eve of His Execution by Thomas Cranmer. On the eve of his execution. Footnote. Printed here from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Slightly abridged. Cranmer's writings in two volumes, edited for the Parker Society by Reverend John Edmund Cox, were published in 1844 to 46. Born in 1489, died in 1556, made chaplain to Henry VIII in 1529. Archbishop of Canterbury in 1533, declared the marriage of Henry and Catherine invalid in 1533, abjured his allegiance to Rome in 1535, member of the Regency for Edward VI in 1547, signed the patent which settled the crown on Lady Jane Grey in 1553, sent to the Tower for treason on the accession of Mary, condemned and burned for heresy. Good people, my dearly beloved brethren in Christ, I beseech you most heartily to pray for me to Almighty God, that he will forgive me all my sins and offenses, 
which are without number and great above measure. But yet one thing grieveth my conscience more than all the rest, whereof, God willing, I intend to speak more hereafter. But how great and how many soever my sins be, I beseech you to pray to God of his mercy to pardon and forgive them all. Here, kneeling down, Cranmer made the following prayer. O Father of heaven, O Son of God, Redeemer of the world, O Holy Ghost, three persons and one God, have mercy upon me, most wretched caitiff and miserable sinner. I have offended both against heaven and earth more than my tongue can express. Whither, then, may I go, or whither shall I flee? To heaven I may be ashamed to lift up mine eyes, and in earth I find no place of refuge or succor. To thee, therefore, O Lord, do I run. To thee do I humble myself, saying, O Lord, my God, my sins be great, but yet have mercy upon me for thy great mercy. The great mystery that God became man was not wrought for little or few offenses. Thou didst not give thy Son, O Heavenly Father, unto death for small sins only, but for all the greatest sins of the world, so that the sinner returned to thee with his whole heart, as I do at this present. Wherefore have mercy on me, O God, whose property is always to have mercy. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for thy great mercy. I crave nothing for my own benefits, but for thy name's sake, that it may be hallowed thereby, and for thy dear Son Jesus Christ's sake. And now, O Father of heaven, hallowed be thy name. After repeating the Lord's Prayer, Cranmer continued, Every man, good people, desireth at the time of his death to give some good exhortation, that others may remember the same before their death, and be the better thereby. So I beseech God to grant me grace that I may speak something at this, my departing, whereby God may be glorified and you edified. First, it is a heavy cause to see that so many folk so much dote upon the love of this false world, and be so careful for it, that of the love of God, or the world to come, they seem to care very little or nothing. Therefore, this shall be my first exhortation, that you set not your minds over much upon this deceitful world, but upon God, and upon the world to come, and to learn to know what this lesson meaneth, which St. John teacheth that the love of this world is hatred against God. The second exhortation is, that next unto God you obey your king and queen willingly and gladly, without murmuring or grudging, not for fear of them only, but much more for the fear of God, knowing that they be God's ministers, appointed by God to rule and govern you, and therefore whoever resisteth them resisteth the ordinance of God. The third exhortation is that you love altogether like brethren and sisters. For alas, pity it is to see what contention and hatred one Christian man beareth to another, not take at each other as brother and sister, but rather as strangers and mortal enemies. But I pray you learn and bear well away this one lesson, to do good unto all men, as much as in you lieth, and to hurt no man, no more than you would hurt your own natural loving brother or sister. For this you may be sure of, that whosoever hateth any person, and goeth about maliciously to hinder or hurt him surely, and without all doubt, God is not with that man, although he think himself ever so much in God's favor. And now, for as much as I am come to my last end of my life, whereupon hangeth all my life past and all my life to come, either to live with my master Christ forever in joy, or else to be in pain forever with wicked devils in hell. And I see before mine eyes presently either heaven ready to receive me, or else hell ready to swallow me up. I shall therefore declare unto you my very faith now I believe, without any color of dissimulation, for now is no time to dissemble, whatsoever I have said or written in times past. First, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, etc., and I believe every article of the Catholic faith, 
every word and sentence taught by our Savior Jesus Christ, his apostles and prophets, in the New and Old Testament. And now I come to the great thing which so much troubleth my conscience, more than anything that ever I did or said in my whole life, and that is the setting abroad of a writing contrary to the truth, which now I here renounce and refuse, as things written in my hand contrary to the truth, footnote, a reference to the recantation which he had signed while imprisoned in the tower, end of footnote, what which I thought in my heart, and written for fear of death, and to save my life if it might be, and that is, all such bills and papers which I have written or signed with my hand since my degradation, wherein I have written many things untrue. And for as much as my hand hath offended, writing contrary to my heart, therefore my hand shall first be punished. For when I come to the fire, it shall be first burned. And as for the Pope, I refuse him, as Christ's enemy and antichrist, with all his false doctrine. And as for the sacrament, I believe as I have taught in my book against the Bishop of Winchester, which my book teacheth so true a doctrine of the sacrament, that it shall stand at the last day before the judgment of God, where the papistical doctrine contrary thereto shall be ashamed to show her face. End of section 4. Recording by Rav Agarwal. Section 5 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arav Agarwal. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. On the First Temptation of Christ by John Knox. Footnote. From the text, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert, that he should be tempted of the devil. Matt four. 1. Knox's writings, edited by David Lang, were published in four volumes octavo in 1846-55. to 55. End of footnote. Born in 1505, died in 1572, became a preacher in 1547, promoting the Reformation, visited Calvin in 1554, returned to Scotland in 1559, secured the abolition of Roman Catholicism in Scotland, and the organization of the Presbyterian Church. The cause moving me to treat of this place of scripture is that such as by the inscrutable providence of God fall into diverse temptations, judge not themselves by reasons thereof to be less acceptable in God's presence, but, on the contrary, have the way prepared to victory by Christ Jesus, they shall not fear above measure the crafty assaults of that subtle serpent Satan, but with joy and bold courage, having such a guide as here is pointed forth, such a champion, and such weapons as here is are to be found, if with obedience we will hear and unfeigned faith believe, we may assure ourselves of God's present behavior and a final victory by the means of him who, for our safeguard and deliverance, entered in the battle and triumphed over his adversary and all his raging fury. And that this, being heard and understood, may the better be kept in memory, this order, by God's grace, we propose to observe in treating the matter. First, what this word temptation means, and how it is used within the scriptures. Secondly, who is here tempted, and at what time this temptation happened? Thirdly, how and by what means he was tempted? Fourthly, why he should suffer from these temptations, and what fruit ensues to us from the same? First, Temptation, or to tempt in the scriptures of God, is called to try, to prove, or to assault the valor, the power, the will, the pleasure, or the wisdom, whether it be of God or of creatures. And it is taken sometimes in good part, as when it is said that God tempted Abraham, God tempted the people of Israel, that is, God did try and examine them, not for his own knowledge, to whom nothing is hid, but to certify others how obedient Abraham was to God's commandment and how weak and inferior the Israelites were in their journey toward the promised land. And this temptation is always good, because it proceeds immediately from God, to open and make manifest the secret motions of men's hearts, 
the puissance and power of God's word, and the great lenity and gentleness of God towards the iniquities, yea, horrible sins and rebellions, of those whom he hath received into his regimen and care. For who could have believed that the bare word of God could so have moved the heart and affections of Abraham that to obey God's commandment he determined to kill with his own hand his best beloved son Isaac? Who could have trusted that so many torments as Job suffered he should not speak in all his great temptations one foolish word against God? Or who could have thought that God so mercifully should have pardoned so many and so manifest transgressions committed by his people in the desert? and yet that his mercy never utterly left them, but still continued with them till at length he performed his promise made to Abraham. Who, I say, would have been persuaded of these things unless, by trials and temptations taken of his creatures by God, they come by revelation made in his holy scriptures to our knowledge? And so this kind of temptation is profitable, good, and necessary, as a thing proceeding from God, who is the fountain of all goodness, to the manifestation of his own glory and to the profit of the sufferer, however the flesh may judge in the hour of temptation. Otherwise temptation, or to tempt, is taken an evil part, that is, he that assaults or assails intends destruction and confusion to him that is assaulted, as when Satan tempted the woman in the garden, Job by diverse tribulations, and David by adultery. The scribes and Pharisees tempted Christ by diverse means, questions, and subtleties. And of this manner, saith St. James, God tempted no man. That is, by temptation proceeding immediately from him, he intends no man's destruction. And here you shall note that although Satan appears sometimes to prevail against God's elect, yet he is ever frustrated of his final purpose. By temptation he led Eve and David from the obedience of God but he could not retain them forever in his thraldom. Power was granted to him to spoil Job of his substance and children, and to strike his body with a plague and sickness most vile and fearful, but he could not compel his mouth to blaspheme God's majesty. And therefore, although we are laid open sometimes, as it were, to tribulation for a time, it is that when he has poured forth the venom of his malice against God's elect, it may return to his own confusion and that the deliverance of God's children may be more to his glory and the comfort of the afflicted, knowing that his hand is so powerful, his mercy and good will so prompt, that he delivers his little ones from their cruel enemy, even as David did his sheep and lambs from the mouth of the lion. Also to tempt means simply to prove or try without any determinate purpose of profit or damage to ensue, as when the mind doubteth of anything and therein desires to be satisfied without great love or extreme hatred of the thing that is tempted or tried, as the queen of Sheba came to tempt Solomon in subtle questions. David tempted, that is, tried himself if he could go in harness. Y, Sam, XVII. And Gideon said, Let not thine anger kindle against me if I tempt thee once again. This famous queen, not fully trusting the report and fame that was spread of Solomon, by subtle questions desired to prove his wisdom, at the first neither extremely hating nor fervently loving the person of the king. And David, as a man not accustomed to harness, would try how he was able to go and believe and fashion himself therein, before he would hazard battle with Goliath so armed. And Gideon, not satisfied in his conscience by the first sign that he received, desired without content or hatred of God, a second time to be certified of his vocation. In this sense must the apostle be expounded when he commands us to tempt, that is, to try and examine ourselves, if we stand in the faith. Thus much for the term. Now to the person tempted, and to the time and place of his temptation. The person tempted is the only well-beloved son of God. The time was immediately after his baptism, and the place was the desert or wilderness. But that we derive advantage from what is related, we must consider the same more profoundly. That the Son of God was thus tempted gives instruction to us that temptations, although they be ever so grievous and fearful, do not separate us from God's favor and mercy, but rather declare the great graces of God to appertain to us, which makes Satan to rage as a roaring lion. For against none does he so fiercely fight as against those of whose hearts Christ has taken possession." 
This spirit which led Christ into the wilderness was not the devil, but the Holy Spirit of God the Father, by whom Christ, as touching his human and manly nature, was conducted and led. Likewise, by the same spirit, he was strengthened and made strong, and finally raised up from the dead. The spirit of God, I say, led Christ to the place of this battle, where he endured the combat for the whole forty days and nights. As Luke saith, he was tempted, but in the end most vehemently, after his continual fasting, and that he began to be hungry. Upon this forty days and this fasting of Christ do our papists found and build their Lent. For, say they, all the actions of Christ are our instructions. What he did we ought to follow. But he fasted forty days, therefore we ought to do the like. I answer that if we ought to follow all Christ's actions, then ought we neither to eat nor drink for the space of forty days, for so fasted Christ. We ought to go upon the waters with our feet, to cast out devils by the word, to heal and cure all sorts of maladies, to call again the dead to life, for so did Christ. This I write only that men may see the vanity of those who, boasting themselves of wisdom, have become mad fools. Did Christ fast thus forty days to teach us superstitious fasting? Can the papists assure me, or any other man, which were the forty days and nights that Christ fasted? Plain it is, he fasted forty days and nights that immediately followed his baptism, but which they were, or in what month was the day of his baptism, Scripture does not express. And although the day were expressed, am I or any Christian bound to counterfeit Christ's actions as the ape counterfeits the act or work of man? He himself requires no such obedience of his true followers, but say it to the apostles, Go and preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, commanding them to observe and keep all that I have commanded you. But where the papists are so diligent in establishing their dreams and fantasies, they lose the profit that here is to be gathered. That is, why Christ fasted those forty days, which were a doctrine more necessary for Christians that to corrupt the simple hearts with superstition, as though the wisdom of God, Christ Jesus, had taught us no other mystery by his fasting that the abstinence from flesh, or once on the day to eat flesh, for the space of forty days. God hath taken a just vengeance upon the pride of such men, while he thus confounds the wisdom of those that do most glory in wisdom, and strikes with blindness as will be guides and lanterns to the feet of others, and yet refuse themselves to hear or follow the light of God's word. From such deliver thy poor flock, O Lord. The causes of Christ's fasting these forty days I find chiefly to be two. The first, to witness to the world the dignity and excellence of his vocation, which Christ, after his baptism, was to take upon him openly. The other, to declare that he entered into battle willingly for our cause, and does, as it were, provoke his adversary to assault him, although Christ Jesus in the internal counsel of his father, was appointed to be the prince of peace, the angel that is the messenger of his testament, and he alone that could fight our battles for us. Yet he did not enter an execution of it, in the sight of men, till he was commended to mankind by the voice of his heavenly father, and that as he was placed and anointed by the Holy Ghost by a visible sign given to the eyes of men. After which time he was led to the desert, and fasted, and this he did to teach us with what fear, carefulness, and reverence the messengers of the word ought to enter on their vocation, which is not only most excellent, for who is worthy to be God's ambassador, but also subject to most extreme troubles and dangers. But to our purpose, that Christ exceeded not the space of forty days in his fasting, he did it to the imitation of Moses and Elias, of whom the one before the receiving of the law and the other before the communication and reasoning which he had with God in Mount Horeb, in which he was commanded to anoint Hazael king over Syria, and Jehu king over Israel, and Elisha to be prophet, fasting the same number of days. The events that ensued and followed the supernatural fasting of these two servants of God, Moses and Elias, impaired and diminished the tyranny of the kingdom of Satan. For by the law came the knowledge of sin, the damnation of such impieties, especially of idolatry, as such as the devil had invented, 
And finally, by the law came such a revelation of God's will that no man could justly afterward excuse his sin by ignorance, by which the devil before had blinded many. So that the law, although it might not renew and purge the heart, for that the Spirit of Christ Jesus worketh by faith only, yet it was a bridle that did hinder and stay the rage of external wickedness in many, and was a schoolmaster that led unto Christ. For when man can find no power in himself to do that which is commanded, and perfectly understands, and when he believes that the curse of God is pronounced against all those that abide not in everything that is commanded in God's law to do them, the man, I say, that understands and knows his own corrupt nature and God's severe judgment, most gladly will receive the free redemption offered by Christ Jesus, which is the only victory that overthrows Satan and his power. And so, by the giving of the law, God greatly weakened, impaired, and made frail the tyranny and kingdom of the devil. In the days of Elias, the devil had so prevailed that kings and rulers made open war against God killing his prophets, destroying his ordinances, and building up idolatry, which did so prevail that the prophet complained that of all the true farers and worshippers of God he was left alone, and wicked Jezebel sought his life also. After this, his fasting and complaint, he was sent by God to anoint the persons aforenamed, who took such vengeance upon the wicked and obstinate idolaters that he who escaped the sword of Hazael fell into the hands of Jehu, and those whom Jehu left escaped, not God's vengeance under Elisha. The remembrance of this was fearful to Satan, for at the coming of Christ Jesus, impiety was in the highest degree among those that pretended most knowledge of God's will. And Satan was at such rest in his kingdom that the priests, scribes, and Pharisees had taken away the key of knowledge. That is, they had so obscured and darkened God's holy scriptures by false glosses and vain traditions that neither would they enter themselves into the kingdom of God, nor suffer or and permit others to enter, but with violence restrained and with tyranny struck back from the right way, namely from Christ Jesus himself, such as would have entered into the possession of life everlasting by him. Satan, I say, having such dominion over the chief rulers of the visible church, and espying in Christ such graces as before he had not seen in man, and considering him to fall in fasting the footsteps of Moses and Elias, no doubt greatly feared that the quietness and spread of his most obedient servants, the priests and their adherents, would be troubled by Christ. O oh, dear sisters, what comfort ought the remembrance of these signs be to our hearts? Christ Jesus had fought our battle. He himself hath taken us into his care and protection. However the devil may rage by temptations, be they spiritual or corporeal, he is not able to bereave us out of the hand of the Almighty Son of God. To him be all glory, for his mercies most abundantly poured upon us. End of section 5. Recording by Arav Agarwal. Section 6 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Megan Lamb. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. His Last Words on the Scaffold, by Sir Walter Raleigh. Born in 1552, died in 1618, commanded in 1580 an English company in Ireland, where he introduced the potato in 1584, a captain of the guard in 1587, sent expeditions to Virginia in 1584, 85, 87, and 90, served against the Armada in 1588, explored the Orinoco in 1595, commanded a squadron which destroyed the Spanish fleet in Cadiz in 1596, accused of treason and sent to the Tower in 1603, writing while there his History of the World commanded an unsuccessful expedition to South America in 1616, condemned and executed in 1618. Footnote. Delivered in the Old Palace Yard at Westminster, October 29, 1618. When Raleigh's head lay on the block awaiting the axe, someone remarked that it ought to be turned to the east. What matter, said he, how the head lie if the heart be right? 
Raleigh's writings in a complete edition of eight octavo volumes were published at Oxford in 1829. End of footnote. I thank my God heartily that he hath brought me into the light to die, and not suffered me to die in the dark prison of the tower, where I have suffered a great deal of adversity and a long sickness. And I thank God that my fever hath not taken me at this time, as I prayed God it might not. There are two main points of suspicion that his majesty hath conceived against me, wherein his majesty cannot be satisfied, which I desire to clear and resolve you in. One is, that his majesty hath been informed that I have had some plot with France, and his majesty had some reason to induce him thereunto. One reason that his majesty had to conjecture so was that when I came back from Guana, being come to Plymouth, I endeavoured to go to Rochelle, which was because I would fain have made my peace before I came to England. Another reason was that upon my flight I did intend to fly to France for saving of my life, having had some terror from above. A third reason was the French agents coming to me, and it was reported I had commission from the King of France. But this I say, for a man to call God to witness to a falsehood at any time is a grievous sin, and what shall we hope for at the day of judgment? But to call God to witness to a falsehood at the time of death is far more grievous and impious, and there is no hope for such a one. And what should I expect that I am now going to render an account of my faith? I do, therefore, call the Lord to witness, as I hope to be saved, and as I hope to be seen in his kingdom, which will be within this quarter of an hour, that I never had any commission from the king of France, nor any treaty with a French agent, nor with any from the French king. Neither knew I that there was an agent, or what he was, till I met him in my gallery at my lodging, unlooked for. If I speak not the truth, O Lord, let me never come into thy glory. The second suspicion was that his majesty hath been informed that I should speak dishonorably and disloyally of him. But my accuser was a base Frenchman, a kind of chemical fellow, one whom I knew to be perfidious, for being drawn into this action at Winchester, in which my hand was touched, and he being sworn to secrecy overnight, he revealed it in the morning. But in this I speak now, what have I to do with kings? I have nothing to do with them, neither do I fear them. I have now to do with God. Therefore, as I hope to be saved at the last day, I never spoke dishonorably, disloyally, nor dishonestly of the king, neither to this Frenchman, nor to any other. Neither had I ever, in all my life, a thought of ill against his majesty. Therefore, I cannot but think it strange that this Frenchman, being so base, so mean a fellow, should be so far credited. And so much for this point. I have dealt truly, and I hope I shall be believed. I confess I did attempt to escape, and I did dissemble, and made myself sick at Salisbury, but I hope it was no sin. The prophet David did make himself a fool, and did suffer spittle to fall upon his beard to escape the hands of his enemies, and it was not imputed to him as sin, and I did it to prolong time till his majesty came, hoping for some commiseration from him. I forgave this Frenchman and Sir Louis Stukeley, and have received the sacrament this morning from Mr. Dean, and I do also forgive all the world, but this much I am bound in charity to speak of this man, that all men may take good heed of him. Sir Louis Stukeley, my kinsman and keeper, hath affirmed that I should tell him that I did tell Lord Carew and Lord Doncaster of my pretended escape. It was not likely that I should acquaint two privy counsellors of my purpose. Neither would I tell him, for he left me six, seven, eight, nine, or ten days to go where I listed while he wrote about the country. Again, he accused me that I should tell him that Lord Carew and Lord Doncaster would meet me in France, which was never my speech or thought. Thirdly, he accused me that I showed him a letter, and that I should give him eleven thousand euros or ten thousand euros. I merely showed him a letter that if he would go with me, his debts should be paid when he was gone. Neither had I one thousand euros, for if I had had so much, I could have done better with it, and had made my peace otherwise. Fourthly, when I came to Sir Edward Pelham, who had been sometimes a follower of mine, who gave me good entertainment, he gave out that I had received some dram of poison in Sir Edward Pelham's house, when I answered that I feared no such thing, for I was well assured of them in the house. Now God forgive him, for I do, and I desire God to forgive him. 
I will not only say, God is the God of revenge, but I desire God to forgive him, as I hope to be forgiven. I will speak but a word or two more, because I will not trouble Mr. Sheriff too long. There was a report spread that I should rejoice at the death of Lord Essex, and that I should take tobacco in his presence. When, as I protest, I shed tears at his death, though I was one of the contrary faction, and at the time of his death I was all the while in the armory at the further end where I could but see him. I was sorry that I was not with him, for I heard he had a desire to see me and be reconciled to me. So that, I protest, I lamented his death, and good cause had I, for after he was gone, I was little beloved. And now I entreat you all to join with me in prayer, that the great God of heaven, whom I have grievously offended, being a man full of all vanity, and having lived a sinful life in all sinful callings, having been a soldier, a captain, a sea captain, and a courtier, which are all places of wickedness and vice, that God, I say, would forgive me, cast away my sins from me, and receive me into everlasting life. So I take my leave of you all, making my peace with God. End of section 6 Recording by Megan Lamb Section 7 of The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Megan Lamb The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3 On the Condition of England by Sir John Eliot Footnote Delivered in the House of Commons, June 3, 1628. Corrected by Eliot himself while imprisoned in the Tower for the third time. Here abridged and printed by permission of Messrs. Longman, Green & Co. End of footnote. Born in 1592, died in 1632, became in 1625 an opposition orator in the first parliament of Charles I imprisoned in 1626 by order of the king, but released when Parliament refused to proceed without him. Took a leading part in drafting the Petition of Right in 1628, arrested in 1629, and sent to the Tower where he died. We sit here as the great council of the king, and, in that capacity, it is our duty to take into consideration the state and affairs of the kingdom and when there is occasion to give them in a true representation by way of counsel and advice what we conceive necessary or expedient for them. In this consideration, I confess, many a sad thought has frighted me, and that not only in respect of our dangers from abroad, which yet I know are great, as they have been often in this place pressed and dilated to us, but in respect of our disorders here at home, which do enforce those dangers as by them they were occasioned. For I believe I shall make it clear to you that as at first the causes of those dangers were our disorders, our disorders still remain our greatest dangers. It is not now so much the potency of our enemies as the weakness of ourselves that threatens us. And that saying of the Father may be assumed by us. Non tam potentia sua quam negligentia nostra. Our want of true devotion to heaven, our insincerity, and doubling in religion, our want of counsels, our precipitate actions, the insufficiency or unfaithfulness of our generals abroad, the ignorance or corruption of our ministers at home, the impoverishing of the sovereign, the oppression and depression of the subject, the exhausting of our treasures, the waste of our provisions, consumption of our ships, destruction of our men, these make the advantage to our enemies, not the reputation of their arms." And if in these there be not reformation, we need no foes abroad. Time itself will ruin us. You will all hold it necessary that what I am about to urge seem not an aspersion on the state or imputation on the government, as I have known such mentions misinterpreted. Far is it from me to purpose this, that have none but clear thoughts of the excellency of his majesty, nor can have other ends but the advancement of his glory. For the first, then, 
are in sincerity and doubting in religion the greatest and most dangerous disorder of all others which have never been unpunished and for which we have so many strange examples of all states and in all times to awe us what testimony does it want will you have authority of books look on the collections of the committee for religion there is too clear an evidence will you have records see then the commission procured for composition with the papists in the north note the proceedings thereupon you will find them to little less amounting than a toleration in effect though upon some slight payments and the easiness in them will likewise show the favor that is intended will you have proofs of men witness the hopes witness the presumptions witness the reports of all the papists generally observe the dispositions of commands the trust of officers the confidence of sec secrecies of employments in this kingdom in ireland and elsewhere they will all show it has too great a certainty and to these add but the incontrovertible evidence of that all-powerful hand which we have felt so sorely to give it full assurance for as the heavens opposed themselves to us it was our impieties that first opposed the heavens for the second our want of counsels that great disorder in a state with which there cannot be stability if effects may show their causes as they are often a perfect demonstration of them our misfortunes our disasters serve to prove it and if reason be allowed in this dark age by the judgment of dependencies the foresight of contingencies in affairs the consequences they draw with them confirm it for if we view ourselves at home are we in strength are we in reputation equal to our ancestors if we view ourselves abroad are our friends as many are our enemies no more do our friends retain their safety and possessions do our enemies enlarge themselves and gain from them and us what counsel to the loss of the palatinate sacrifice both our honor and our men sent thither stopping those greater powers appointed for that service by which it might have been defensible what counsel gave directions to that late action whose wounds lie yet a bleeding i mean the expedition unto ray of which there is yet so sad a memory in all men footnote a reference to buckingham's disastrous expedition during the siege of la rochelle End of footnote. what design for us or advantage to our state could that work import you know the wisdom of our ancestors the practice of their times and how they preserved their safeties we all know and have as much cause to doubt as they had the greatness and ambition of that kingdom which the old world could not satisfy against this greatness and ambition we likewise know the proceedings of that princess that never to be forgotten excellence queen elizabeth whose name without admiration falls not into mention with her enemies you know how she advanced herself how she advanced this kingdom how she advanced this nation in glory and in state how she depressed her enemies how she upheld her friends how she enjoyed a full security and made them then our scorn who now are made our terror some of the principles she built on were these and if i be mistaken let reason and our statesmen contradict me first to maintain in what she might a unity in france that the kingdom being at peace within itself might be a bulwark to keep back the power of spain by land next to preserve an amity and league between that state and us that so we might join in aid of the low countries and by the means receive their help in ships by sea then that this treble cord so wrought between france the states and us might enable us as occasion should require to give assistance unto others by which means the experience of that time doth tell us we were not only free from those fears that now possess and trouble us but then our names were fearful to our enemies see now what correspondence our action hath had with this squared by these rules it did induce as a necessary consequence the division in france between the protestants and their king of which there is too woeful too lamentable an experience it has made an absolute breach between that state and us and so entertains us against france france a preparation against us that we have nothing to promise to our neighbors hardly for ourselves nay but observe the time in which it was attempted and you shall find it not only varying from those principles but directly contrary an opposite ex diametro to those ends 
and such as from the issue and success rather might be thought a conception of spain than begotten here with us footnote buckingham's intrigues with spain are here referred to Eliot's remark produced a sensation at the time, but the outcome of it showed that he had his listeners in a majority with him. End of footnote. Mr. Speaker, I am sorry for this interruption, but much more sorry if there had been occasion, wherein, as I shall submit myself wholly to your judgment, to receive what censure you shall give me if I have offended, so in the integrity of my intentions and clearness of my thoughts, I must still retain this confidence that no greatness might deter me from the duties which I owe to the service of the country, the service of the king. With a true English heart, I shall discharge myself as faithfully and as really to the extent of my poor powers as any man whose honors and whose offices most strictly have obliged him. You know the dangers Denmark was then in and how much they concerned us, what in respect of our alliance with that country, what in the importance of the sound, what an acquisition to our enemies the gain thereof would be, what loss, what prejudice to us. By this division, we, breaking upon France, France being engaged by us, and the Netherlands at amazement between both, neither could intend to aid that luckless king whose loss is our disaster. Can those now, that express their troubles at the hearing of these things, and have so often told us in the presence of their knowledge and the conjunctures and disjunctures of affairs, say they advised in this? Was this an act of counsel, Mr. Speaker? I have more charity than to think it, and unless they make a confession of themselves, I cannot believe it. What shall I say? I wish there was not cause to mention it, and, but out of apprehension of the danger that is to come, if the like choice hereafter be not now prevented, I could willingly be silent. But my duty to my sovereign, and to the service of this house, the safety and the honor of my country are above all respects, and what so nearly trenches to the prejudice of these, made shall not be forborne. For the next undertaking at Ray, I will not trouble you much, only this in short. Was not that whole action carried against the judgment and opinions of the officers, those that were of counsel? Was not the first, was not the last, was not all, in the landing, in the entrenching, in the continuance there, in the assault, in the retreat? Did any advice take place of such as were of the counsel? If there should be a particular disquisition thereof, these things would be manifest, and more. I will not instance now the manifestation that was made for the reason of these arms, nor by whom, nor in what manner, nor on what grounds it was published, nor what effects it has wrought, drawing, as you know, almost all the whole world into league against us. Nor will I mention the leaving of the mines, the leaving of the salts, which were in our possession, and of a value, as it is said, to have answered much of our expense nor that great wonder which nor alexander nor caesar ever did the enriching of the enemy by courtesies when the soldiers wanted help nor the private intercourses and parleys within the fort which continually were held what they intended may be read in the success and upon due examination thereof they would not want the proofs for the last voyage to rochelle there needs no observation it is so fresh in memory nor will I make an inference or corollary at all. Your own knowledge shall judge what truth or what sufficiency they express. For the next, the ignorance or corruption of our ministers, where can you miss of instances? If you survey the court, if you survey the country, if the church of the city be examined, if you observe the bar, if the beach, if the courts, if the shipping, if the land, if the seas, all these will render you variety of proofs, and in such measure and proportion as shows the greatness of our sickness, that if it had not some speedy application for remedy, our case is most desperate. Mr. Speaker, I fear I have been too long in these particulars that are past, and am unwilling to offend you. Therefore, in the rest I shall be shorter, and in that which concerns the impoverishing the king, no other arguments will I use than such as all men grant. The exchequer you know is empty, the reputation thereof gone, the ancient lands are sold, the jewels pawned, the plate engaged, the debt still great, and almost all charges, both ordinary and extraordinary, borne by projects. What poverty can be greater? What necessity so great? What perfect English heart is not almost dissolved into sorrow for the truth? For the oppression of the subject, which I remember, is the next particular I proposed. It needs no demonstration. The whole kingdom is a proof. 
and for the exhausting of our treasures that oppression speaks it what waste of our provisions what consumption of our ships what destruction of our men have been witness the journey to algiers footnote an expedition in which more than thirty english ships were destroyed and their crews made slaves End of footnote. witness that with mansfield witness that to cadiz witness the next witness that to ray witness the last and i pray god we may never have such more witnesses witness likewise the palatinate witness denmark witness the turks witness the dunkirkers witness all what losses we have sustained how we are impaired in munition in ships in men it has no contradiction we were never so much weakened nor had less hope how to be restored these mr speaker are our dangers these are they do threaten us and are like that trojan horse brought in cunningly to surprise us for in these do lurk the strongest of our enemies ready to issue on us and if we do not now the more speedily expel them these will be the sign and invitation to the others they will prepare such entrances that we shall have no means left of refuge or defence for if we have these enemies at home how can we strive with those that are abroad but if we be free from these no other can impeach us our ancient english virtue that old spartan valour cleared from these disorders being in sincerity of religion once made friends with heaven having maturity of councils sufficiency of generals incorruption of officers opulency in the king liberty in the people repletion of treasures restitution of provisions reparation of ships preservation of men our english ancient virtue i say thus rectified will secure us but unless there be a speedy reformation in these i know not what hope or expectations we may have these things sir i shall desire to have taken into consideration that is we are the great council of the kingdom and have the apprehension of these dangers we may truly represent them to the king wherein i conceive we are bound by a treble obligation of duty unto god of duty to his majesty and of duty to our country and therefore i wish it may so stand with the wisdom and judgment of the house that they be drawn into the body of a remonstrance and there with all humility expressed with a prayer unto his majesty that for the safety of himself for the safety of the kingdom for the safety of religion he will be pleased to give us time to make perfect inquisition thereof or to take them into his own wisdom and there give them such timely reformation as the necessity of the cause and his justice do import and thus sir with a large affection and loyalty to his majesty and with a firm duty and service to my country i have suddenly and it may be with some disorder express the weak apprehensions i have wherein if i have erred i humbly crave your pardon and so submit it to the censure of the house end of section seven recording by megan lamb section eight of the world's famous orations volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's famous orations volume three on grievances in the reign of charles the first by john pym footnote delivered on april seventeenth sixteen forty in what is known as the short parliament abridged clarendon describes how after the king's address pym rose to speak while men gazed upon each other looking who should begin in sixteen forty one pym's speech was printed as a speech delivered in parliament by j p esquire as corrected by pym himself it is found among the thomas and tracts End footnote born in fifteen eighty four died in sixteen forty three entered parliament in sixteen twenty one one of the managers of buckingham's impeachment trial in sixteen twenty six advocated the petition of right in sixteen twenty eight assisted in the impeachment of strafford and laud one of the five members whose arrest was attempted by charles the first in sixteen forty two sixteen forty never parliament had greater business to dispatch nor more difficulties to encounter therefore we have reason to take all advantages of order and address and hereby we shall not only do our own work but dispose and enable ourselves for the better satisfaction of his majesty's desire of supply 
The grievances being removed, our affections will carry us with speed and cheerfulness to give His Majesty that which may be sufficient for both His honour and support. Those that in the very first place shall endeavour to redress the grievances will be found not to hinder, but to be the best furtherers of His Majesty's service. He that takes away weights doth as much advantage motion as he that addeth wings. He, that is the speaker, Pym, said he would labor to contract those manifold affairs both of the church and state, which did so earnestly require the wisdom and faithfulness of this house, into a double method of grievances and cures. And because there wanted not some who pretended that these things wherewith the commonwealth is now grieved, are much for the advantage of the king, and that the redress of them will be to his majesty's great disadvantage and loss, he doubted not but to make it appear that in discovering the present great distempers and disorders, and procuring remedy for them, we should be no less serviceable to his majesty who has summoned us to this great council, than useful to those whom we do here represent. For the better effecting whereof, he propounded three main branches of his discourse. In the first he would offer them the several heads of some principal grievances under which the kingdom groaned. In the second he undertook to prove that the disorders from whence those grievances issued were as hurtful to the king as to the people. In the third he would advise such a way of healing and removing those grievances as might be equally effectual to maintain the honour and greatness of the king, and to procure the prosperity and contentment of the people. The greatest liberty of the kingdom is religion. Thereby we are freed from spiritual evils, and no impositions are so grievous as those that are laid upon the soul. The next great liberty is justice, whereby we are preserved from injuries in our persons and estates. From this is derived into the commonwealth peace and order and safety, and when this is interrupted confusion and danger are ready to overwhelm all. The third great liberty consists in the power and privilege of parliaments, for this is the fountain of law, the great council of the kingdom, the highest court. This is enabled by the legislative and conciliary power to prevent evils to come, by the judiciary power to suppress and remove evils present. If you consider these three great liberties in the order of dignity, this last is inferior to the other two, as means are inferior to the end. But if you consider them in the order of necessity and use, this may justly claim the first place in our care, because the end cannot be obtained without the means. And if we do not preserve this, we cannot long hope to enjoy either of the others. Therefore, being to speak of those grievances which lie upon the kingdom, he would observe this order. The privileges of Parliament were not given for the ornament or advantage of those who are the members of Parliament. They have a real use and efficacy toward that which is the end of Parliaments. We are free from suits that we may the more entirely addict ourselves to the public services. We have therefore liberty of speech that our counsels may not be corrupted with fear, or our judgments perverted with self-respects. These three great faculties and functions of Parliament, the legislative, judiciary, and conciliary power, cannot be well exercised without such privileges as these. The wisdom of our laws, the faithfulness of our counsels, the righteousness of our judgments can hardly be kept pure and untainted if they proceed from distracted and restrained minds. Then he propounded divers particular points wherein the privileges of Parliament had been broken. First, in restraining the members of the House from speaking. Secondly, in forbidding the Speaker to put any question. These two were practiced the last day of the last Parliament, and, as was alleged by His Majesty's command, and both of them trench upon the very life and being of parliaments. For if such a restraining power as this should take root and be admitted, it will be impossible for us to bring any resolution to perfection in such matters as shall displease those about the king. Thirdly, by imprisoning divers members of the House for matters done in parliament. Fourthly, by indictments, informations, and judgments in ordinary and inferior courts for speeches and proceedings in parliaments. Fifthly, by the disgraceful order of the King's Bench, whereby some members of this house were enjoined to put in security of their good behavior, and for refusal thereof were continued in prison divers years, without any particular allegation against them. One of them was freed by death. Others were not dismissed till His Majesty had declared his intention to summon the present Parliament. And this he noted not only as a breach of privilege, but as a violation of the common justice of the kingdom. 
sixthly by the sudden and abrupt dissolution of parliaments contrary to the law and custom often hath it been declared in parliaments that the parliaments should not be dissolved till the petitions be answered this he said was a great grievance because it doth prevent the redress of other grievances it were a hard case that a private man should be put to death without being heard as this representative body of the commons receives a being by the summons so it receives a civil death by the dissolution it is not a much more heavy doom by which we lose our being to have this civil death inflicted on us in displeasure and not to be allowed time and liberty to answer for ourselves that we should not only die but have this mark of infamy laid upon us to be made in testables disabled to make our wills to dispose of our business as this house hath always used to do before adjournments or dissolutions yet this hath often been our case we have not been permitted to pour out our last sighs and groans into the bosom of our dear sovereign the words of dying men are full of piercing affections if we might be heard to speak no doubt we should so fully express our love and faithfulness to our prince as might take off the false suggestions and aspersions of others at least we should in our humble supplications recommend some such things to him in the name of his people as would make for his own honour and the public good of his kingdom thus he concluded the first sort of grievances being such as were against the privilege of parliament and passed on to the next concerning religion all which he conveyed under these four heads the first was the great encouragement given to popery of which he produced these particular evidences a suspension of all the laws against papists whereby they enjoy a free and almost public exercise of that religion those good statutes which were made for restraint of idolatry and superstition are now a ground of security to them in the practice of both being used to no other end but to get money into the king's purse which as it is clearly against the intentions of the law so it is full of mischief to the kingdom by this means a dangerous party is cherished and increased who are ready to close with any opportunity of disturbing the peace and safety of the state yet he did not desire any new laws against popery or any rigorous courses in the execution of those already in force he was far from seeking the ruin of their persons or estates only he wished they might be kept in such a condition as should restrain them from doing hurt a second encouragement is their admission into places of power and trust in the commonwealth whereby they get many dependents and adherents not only of their own but even as such as make profession to be protestants a third their freedom of resorting to london and the court whereby they have opportunity not only of communicating their counsels and designs one to another but of diving into his majesty's counsels by the frequent access of those who are active men among them to the tables and company of great men and under subtle pretences and disguises they want not means of cherishing their own projects and of endeavouring to mould and bias the public affairs to the great advantage of that party a fourth that as they have a congregation of cardinals at rome to consider of the aptest ways and means of establishing the pope's authority and religion in england so they have a nuncio here to act and dispose that party to the execution of those councils and by the assistance of such cunning and jesuitical spirits as swarm in this town to order and manage all actions and events to the furtherance of that main end having dispatched these several points he proceeded to the third kind of grievances being such as are against the common justice of the realm in the liberty of our persons and propriety of our estates of which he has many to propound in doing whereof he would rather observe the order of time wherein they were acted than of consequence but when he should come to the cure he should then persuade the house to begin with those which were of most importance as being now in execution and very much pressing and exhausting the commonwealth since the breach of the last parliament his majesty hath by a new book of rates very much increased the burden upon merchandise and now tonnage and poundage old and new impositions are all taken by prerogative without any grant in parliament or authority of law as we conceive from whence divers inconveniences and mischiefs are produced the danger of the precedent that a judgment in one court and in one case is made binding to all the kingdom men's goods are seized their legal suits are stopped and justice denied to those that desire to take the benefit of the law the great sums of money received upon these impositions intended for the guard of the seas claimed and defended upon no ground but of public trust for protection of merchants and defence of the ports are dispersed to other uses and a new tax raised for the same purposes these burdens are so excessive that trade is thereby very much hindered the commodities of our own growth extremely abased and those imported much enhanced 
all which lies not upon the merchant alone, but upon the generality of the subject, and by this means the stock of the kingdom is much diminished, our exportation being less profitable and our importation more changeable. And if the wars and troubles in the neighbor parts had not brought almost the whole stream of trade into this kingdom, we should have found many more prejudicial effects of these impositions long before this time than yet we have done. Especially have they been insupportable to the poor plantations whither many of His Majesty's subjects have been transported in divers parts of the continent and the islands of America in furtherance of a design enlargement in His Majesty's dominions. The adventurers in this noble work have for the most part no other support but tobacco upon which such a heavy rate is set that the king receives twice as much as the true value of the commodity to the owner. Whereas these great burdens have caused divers merchants to apply themselves to a way of traffic abroad by transporting goods from one country to another without bringing them home into England. But now it hath been lately endeavoured to set an imposition upon this trade, so that the king will have a duty even out of those commodities which never come within his dominions, to the great discouragement of such active and industrious men. The third general head of civil grievances was the great inundation of monopolies, whereby heavy burdens are laid not only upon foreign but also native commodities. These began in the soap patent. The principal undertakers in this were divers popish recusants, men of estate and quality, such as in likelihood did not only aim at their private gain, but that by this open breach of law the king and his people might be more fully divided and the ways of parliament men more thoroughly obstructed. Among the infinite inconveniences and mischiefs which this did produce, these few may be observed, the impairing the goodness and enhancing the price of most of the commodities and manufactures of the realm, yea, of those which are of most necessary and common use, as salt, soap, beer, coals, and infinite others, that under color of licenses, trades, and manufactures are restrained to a few hands and many of the subjects deprived of their ordinary way of livelihood that upon such illegal grants a great number of persons had been unjustly vexed by perseverance, imprisonments, attendance upon the council table, forfeiture of goods, and many other ways. The fourth head of civil grievances was that great and unparalleled grievance of the ship money, which though it may seem to have more warrant of law than the rest, because there hath a judgment passed for it, yet in truth it is thereby aggravated if it be considered that the judgment is founded upon the naked opinion of some judges without any written law, without any custom or authority of law-books, yea, without any one precedent for it. Many express laws, many declarations in parliaments, and the constant practice and judgment at all times are against it. Yea, in the very nature of it it will be found to be disproportionate to the case of necessity, which is pretended to be the ground of it. Necessity excludes all formalities and solemnities. It is no time then to make levies and taxes to build and prepare ships. Every man's person, every man's ships, are to be employed for the resisting of an invading enemy. The right on the subject's part was so clear, and the pretensions against it so weak, that he thought no man would venture his reputation or conscience, in the defense of that judgment being so contrary to the grounds of the law, to the practice of former times, and so inconsistent in itself. The seventh great civil grievance hath been the military charges laid upon the several counties of the kingdom sometimes by warrant under his majesty's signature sometimes by letters from the council table and sometimes such had been the boldest and presumption of some men by the order of the lord lieutenants or deputy lieutenant alone this is a growing evil still multiplying and increasing from a few particulars to many from small sums to great it began first to be practised as a loan for supply of coat and conduct money and for this it hath some countenance from the use in queen elizabeth's time when the lords of the council did often desire the deputy lieutenants to procure so much money to be laid out in the country, as the service did require, with a promise to pay it again in London, for which purpose there was a constant warrant in the exchequer. This was the practice in her time and in a great part of King James. But the payments were then so certain, as it was little otherwise than taking up money upon bills of exchange. At this day they followed these precedents in the manner of the demand, for it is with a promise of a repayment but not in the certainty and readiness of satisfaction. The first particular brought into a tax, as he thought, was the muster-master's wages, at which many repined, but being for small sums it began to be generally digested. 
yet in the last parliament this house was sensible of it and to avoid the danger of the precedent that the subject should be forced to make any payments without consent in parliament they thought upon a bill that might be a rule to the lieutenants what to demand and to the people what to pay but the hopes of this bill were dashed in the dissolution of that parliament now of late divers other particulars are growing into practice which make the grievance much more heavy those mentioned were these one pressing men against their will and forcing them which are rich or unwilling to serve to find others in their place two the provisions of public magazines for powder and other munitions spades and pickaxes three the salary of divers officers besides the muster master four the buying of cart horses and carts and hiring of carts for carriages the next head of civil grievances was comprised in the high court of star chamber which some think succeeded that which in the parliament rolls is called magnum concilium and to which parliaments were wont so often to refer those important matters which they had no time to determine but now this court which in the late restoration or erection of it in henry the seventh's time was especially designed to restrain the oppression of great men and to remove the obstructions and impediments of the law this which is both a court of counsel and a court of justice hath been made an instrument of erecting and defending monopolies and other grievances to set a face of right upon those things which are unlawful in their own nature a face of public good upon such as are pernicious in their use and execution the soap patent and divers other evidences thereof may be given so well known as to not require a particular relation and as if this were not enough this court hath lately intermeddled with the ship money divers sheriffs have been questioned for not levying and collecting such sums as their counties have been charged with and if this beginning be not prevented the star chamber will become a court of revenue and it shall be made a crime not to collect or pay such taxes as the state shall require the eleventh head of civil grievances was now come to he said he was gone very high yet he must go a little higher that great and most eminent power of the king of making edicts and proclamations which are said to be legis temporis and by means of which our princes have used to encounter with such sudden and unexpected danger as would not endure so much delay as assembling the great council of the kingdom this which is one of the most glorious beams of majesty most rigorous in commanding reverence and subjection has to our unspeakable grief been often exercised of late for the enjoining and maintaining sundry monopolies and other grants exceeding burdensome and prejudicial to the people the twelfth next now although he was come as high as he could upon the earth yet the presumption of evil men did lead him one step higher even as high as heaven as high as the throne of god it was now he said grown common for ambitious and corrupt men of the clergy to abuse the truth of god and the bond of conscience preaching down the laws and liberties of the kingdom and pretending divine authority for an absolute power in the king to do what he would without persons and goods this hath been so often published in sermons and printed books that it is now the highway to preferment the thirteenth head of civil grievances he would thus express the long intermission of parliaments contrary to the two statutes yet in force whereby it is appointed there should be parliaments once a year at the least and most contrary to the public good of the kingdom since this being well remedied it would generate remedies for all the rest having gone through the several heads of grievances he came to the second main branch propounded in the beginning that the disorders from which these grievances issued were as hurtful to the king as to the people of which he gave divers reasons as to the interruption of the sweet communion which ought to be between the king and his people in matters of grace and supply they have need of him by his general pardon to be secured from projectors and informers to be freed from absolute laws from the subtle devices of such as seek to restrain the prerogative to their own private advantage and the public hurt and he hath need of them for counsel and support in great and extraordinary occasions this mutual intercourse if indeed sustained would so weave the affections and interest of his subjects into his actions and designs that their wealth and their persons would be his his own estate would be managed to most advantage and public undertakings would be prosecuted at the charge and adventure of the subject the victorious attempts in queen elizabeth's time upon portugal spain and the indies were for the greatest part made upon the subject's purses and not upon the queen's though the honour and the profit of the success did most accrue to her those often breaches and discontentments betwixt the king and the people are very apt to diminish his reputation abroad 
and disadvantage his treaties and alliances. The apprehension of the favour and encouragement given to Popery hath much weakened his majesty's party beyond the sea, and impaired that advantage which Queen Elizabeth and his royal father have heretofore made of being heads of the Protestant Union. The innovations in religion and rigour of ecclesiastical courts have forced a great many of his majesty's subjects to forsake the land, whereby not only their persons and their posterity, but their wealth and their industry are lost to this kingdom much to the reduction also of his majesty's customs and subsidies. And among other inconveniences of such a sort, this was especially to be observed that divers clothiers driven out of the country had set up the manufacture of cloth beyond the seas, whereby this state is like to suffer much by abatement of the price of wools, and by want of employment for the poor, both which likewise tend to his majesty's particular loss. The differences and discontents betwixt his majesty and the people at home have in all likelihood diverted his royal thoughts and counsels from those great opportunities which he might have, not only to weaken the house of Austria and to restore the Palatinate, but to gain himself a higher pitch of power and greatness than any of his ancestors. For it is not unknown how weak, how distracted, how discontented the Spanish colonies are in the West Indies. There are now in those parts in New England, Virginia, and the Caribbean Islands, and in the Bermudas, at least sixty thousand able persons of this nation, many of them well armed and their bodies seasoned to that climate, which, with a very small charge, might be set down in some advantageous parts of these pleasant, rich, and fruitful countries, and easily make His Majesty master of all that treasure which not only foments the war, but is the great support of popery in all parts of Christendom. Having thus passed through the first two general branches, he was now come to the third, wherein he was to set down the ways of healing and removing those grievances which consisted of two main branches, first in declaring the law where it was doubtful, the second in better provision for the execution of law where it is clear. But he said because he had already spent much time and begun to find some confusion in his memory, he would refer the particulars to another opportunity, and for the present only move that which was general to all, and which would give weight and advantage to all the particular ways of redress. That is, that we should speedily desire a conference with the lords, and acquaint them with the miserable condition wherein we find the church and state. And as we have already resolved to join in a religious seeking of God in a day of fast and humiliation, so to entreat them to concur with us in a parliamentary course of petitioning the king, as there should be occasion and in searching out the causes and remedies of these many insupportable grievances under which we lie. That so, by the united wisdom and authority of both houses, such courses may be taken as, through God's blessing, may advance the honour and greatness of His Majesty, and restore and establish the peace and prosperity of the kingdom. This, he said, we might undertake with comfort and hope of success. For though there be a darkness upon the land, a thick and palpable darkness like that of Egypt, Yet, as in that, the sun had not lost his light, nor the Egyptians their sight. The interruption was only in the medium. So with us there is still, God be thanked, light in the sun, wisdom and justice in his majesty, to dispel this darkness. And in us there remains a visual faculty, whereby we are enabled to apprehend and move to desire light. And when we shall be blessed in the enjoying of it, we shall thereby be incited to return His Majesty such thanks as may make it shine more clearly in the world, to His own glory, and in the hearts of His people, to their joy and contentment. End of section 8. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 9 of The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. In His Own Defense by Thomas Wentworth, Earl of Strafford. Footnote. Delivered at his trial before the House of Lords on April 13, 1641, his execution taking place on May 12th of the same year. Slightly abridged. In footnote, born in 1593, died in 1641, served in Parliament as an opponent of the royal policy from 1614 until 1629, raised to the peerage in 1628, a privy councillor in 1629, Lord Deputy of Ireland in 1632, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in 1640, 
commander of the army against the Scotch in 1640, impeached by Parliament in 1641, and condemned by Bill of Attainder. 1641. My lords, this day I stand before you charged with high treason. The burden of the charge is heavy, yet far the more so because it hath borrowed the authority of the House of Commons. If they were not interested, I might expect a no less easy than I do a safe issue. But let neither my weakness plead my innocence, nor their power my guilt. If your lordships will conceive of my defences as they are in themselves without reference to either party, and I shall endeavour so to present them, I hope to go hence as clearly justified by you as I now am in the testimony of a good conscience by myself. My lords, I have all along during this charge watched to see that poisoned arrow of treason which some men would fain have feathered in my heart, but in truth it has not been my quickness to discover any such evil, yet within my breast, though now perhaps by sinister information sticking to my clothes. They tell me of a twofold treason, one against the statute, another by the common law, this direct, that consecutive, this individual, that accumulative, this in itself, that by way of construction. As to this charge of treason, I must and do acknowledge that if I had the least suspicion of my own guilt, I would save your lordships the pains. I would cast the first stone. I would pass the first sentence of condemnation against myself. And whether it be so or not, I now refer to your lordships' judgment and deliberation. You, and you only, under the care and protection of my gracious master, are my judges. Under favour, none of the commons are my peers, nor can they be my judges. I shall ever celebrate the providence and wisdom of your noble ancestors who have put the keys of life and death, so far as concern you and your posterity, into your own hands. None but your own selves, my lords, know the rate of your noble blood. None but yourselves must hold the balance in disposing of the same. The first charge seemeth to be used rather to make me odious than guilty. For there is not the least proof alleged, nor could there be any concerning my confederacy with the popish faction. Never was a servant in authority under my lord and master more hated and maligned by these men than myself and that for an impartial and strict execution of the laws against them. For observe, my lords, that the greater number of the witnesses against me, whether from Ireland or from Yorkshire, were of that religion. But for my own resolution I thank God I am ready every hour of the day to seal my dissatisfaction to the Church of Rome with my dearest blood. Give me leave, my lords, here to pour forth the grief of my soul before you. These proceedings against me seem to be exceedingly rigorous and to have more of prejudice than equity, that upon a supposed charge of hypocrisy or errors in religion I should be made so odious to three kingdoms. A great many thousand eyes have seen my accusations, whose ears will never hear that when it came to the upshot those very things were not alleged against me. Is this fair dealing among Christians? But I have lost nothing by that. Popular applause was ever nothing in my conceit. The uprightness and integrity of a good conscience ever were, and ever shall be, my continual feast. And if I can be justified in your lordship's judgments from this great imputation, as I hope I am, seeing these gentlemen have thrown down the bucklers, I shall account myself justified by the whole kingdom, because absolved by you who are the better part, the very soul and life of the kingdom." As for my designs against the state, I dare plead as much innocency as in the matter of religion. I have ever admired the wisdom of our ancestors who have so fixed the pillars of this monarchy that each of them keeps a due proportion and measure with the others, having so admirably bound together the nerves and sinews of the state that the straining of any one may bring danger and sorrow to the whole economy. The prerogative of the crown and the propriety of the subject have such natural relations that this takes nourishment from that, and that foundation and nourishment from this. And so, as in the lute, if any one string be wound up too high or too low, you have lost the whole harmony. So here the excess of prerogative is oppression, of pretended liberty in the subject is disorder and anarchy. The prerogative must be used as God doth his omnipotence upon extraordinary occasions. 
the laws must have place at all other times as there must be prerogative because there must be extraordinary occasions so the propriety of the subject is ever to be maintained if it go in equal pace with the other they are fellows and companions that are and ever must be inseparable in a well-ordered kingdom and no way is so fitting so natural to nourish and entertain both as the frequent use of parliaments by which a commerce and acquaintance is kept up between the king and his subjects these thoughts have gone along with me these fourteen years of my public employments and shall god willing go with me to the grave god his majesty and my own conscience yea and all of those who have been most accessory to my inward thoughts can bear me witness that i ever did inculcate this that the happiness of a kingdom doth consist in a just poise of the king's prerogative in the subject's liberty and that things could never go well till these went hand in hand together i thank god for it by my master's favour and the providence of my ancestors i have an estate which so interests me in the commonwealth that i have no great mind to be a slave but a subject nor could i wish the cards to be shuffled over again in hopes to fall upon a better set nor did i ever nourish such base and mercenary thoughts as to become a pander to the tyranny and ambition of the greatest man living no i have and ever shall aim at a fair but bounded liberty remembering always that i am a free man yet a subject that i have rights but under a monarch it hath been my misfortune now when i am grey-headed to be charged by the mistakers of the times who are so highly bent that all appears to them to be in the extreme for monarchy which is not for themselves hence it is that designs words yea intentions are brought out as demonstrations of my misdemeanours such a multiplying glass is a prejudicate opinion the articles against me refer to expressions and actions my expressions either in ireland or in england my actions either before or after these late stirs some of the expressions referred to were uttered in private and i do protest against their being drawn to my injury in this place if my lords words spoken to friends in familiar discourse spoken at one's table spoken in one's chamber spoken in one's sick-bed spoken perhaps to gain better reason to gain one's self more clear light and judgment by reasoning if these things shall be brought against a man as treason this under favour takes away the comfort of all human society by this means we shall be debarred from speaking the principal joy and comfort of life with wise and good men to become wiser and better ourselves if these things be strained to take away life and honour and all that is desirable this will be a silent world a city will become a hermitage and sheep will be found among a crowd and press of people no man will dare to impart his solitary thoughts or opinions to his friend and neighbour other expressions have been urged against me which were used in giving counsel to the king my lords these words were not wantonly or unnecessarily spoken or whispered in a corner they were spoken in full counsel when by the duty of my oath i was obliged to speak according to my heart and conscience in all things concerning the king's service if i had forborne to speak what i had conceived to be for the benefit of the king and the people i had been perjured toward almighty god and for delivering my mind openly and freely shall i be in danger of my life as a traitor if that necessity be put upon me i thank god by his blessing i have learned not to stand in fear of him who can only kill the body if the question be whether i must be traitor to man or perjured to god i will be faithful to my creator and whatsoever shall befall me from popular rage or my own weakness i must leave it to that almighty being and to the justice and honour of my judges my lords i conjure you not to make yourselves so unhappy as to disable your lordships and your children from undertaking the great charge and trust of this commonwealth you inherit that trust from your fathers you are born to great thoughts you are nursed for the weighty employments of the kingdom but if it be once admitted that a counsellor for delivering his opinion with others at the council board candide at cast with candour and purity of motive under an oath of secrecy and faithfulness shall be brought into question upon some misapprehension or ignorance of law if every word that he shall speak from sincere and noble intentions shall be drawn against him for the attaining of him his children and posterity i know not under favour i speak it 
any wise or noble person of fortune who will upon such perilous and unsafe terms adventure to be counsellor to the king therefore i beseech your lordship so as to look on me that my misfortune may not bring an inconvenience to yourselves and though my words were not so advised and discreet or so well weighed as they ought to have been yet i trust your lordships are too honourable and just to lay them to my charge as high treason opinions may make a heretic but that they make a traitor i have never heard till now i only admire how i being an incendiary against the scots in the twenty-third article am become a confederate with them in the twenty-eighth article how i could be charged for betraying newcastle and also for fighting with the scots at newburn since fighting against them was no possible means of betraying the town into their hands but rather to hinder their passage thither i never advised war any further than in my poor judgment it concerned the very life of the king's authority and the safety and honour of his kingdom nor did i ever see that any advantage could be made by war in scotland where nothing could be gained but hard blows for my part i honour that nation but i wish they may ever be under their own climate i have no desire that they should be too well acquainted with the better soil of england my lords you see what has been alleged for this constructive or rather destructive treason for my part i have not the judgment to conceive that such treason is agreeable to the fundamental grounds either of reason or of law not of reason for how can that be treason in the lump or mass which is not so in any of its parts or how can that make a thing treasonable which is not so in itself not of law since neither statute common law nor practice hath from the beginning of the government ever mentioned such a thing it is hard my lords to be questioned upon a law which cannot be shown where hath this fire lain hidden for so many hundred years without smoke to discover it till it thus bursts forth to consume me and my children my lords do we not live under laws and must we be punished by laws before they are made far better were it to live by no laws at all but to be governed by those characters of virtue and discretion which nature hath stamped upon us than to put this necessity of divination upon a man and to accuse him of a breach of law before it is a law at all if a waterman upon the thames split his boat by grating upon an anchor and the same shall have no buoy appended to it the owner of the anchor is to pay the loss but if a buoy be set there every man passeth upon his own peril now where is the mark where is the token set upon the crime to declare it to be high treason my lords be pleased to give that regard to the peerage of england as never to expose yourselves to such moot points such constructive interpretations of law if there must be a trial of wits let the subject matter be something else than the lives and honour of peers it will be wisdom for yourselves and your posterity to cast into the fire these bloody and mysterious volumes of constructive and arbitrary treason as the primitive christians did their books of curious arts and betake yourselves to the plain letter of the law and statute which telleth what is and what is not treason without being ambitious to be more learned in the art of killing than our forefathers these gentlemen tell us that they speak in defence of the commonwealth against my arbitrary laws give me leave to say it i speak in defence of the commonwealth against their arbitrary treason it is now full two hundred and forty years since any man was touched for this alleged crime to this height before myself let us not awaken those sleeping lions to our destruction by taking up a few musty records that have lain by the walls for so many ages forgotten or neglected my lords what is my present misfortune may be forever yours it is not the smallest part of my grief that not the crime of treason but my other sins which are exceeding many have brought me to this bar and except your lordship's wisdom provide against it the shedding of my blood may make way for the tracing out of yours you your estates your posterity lie at the stake for my poor self if it were not for your lordship's interest and the interest of a saint in heaven who hath left me here two pledges on earth footnote a reference to his wife and children followed by tears which strafford sought in vain to check end footnote i should never have taken the pains to keep up this ruinous cottage of mine it is loaded with such infirmities that in truth i have no great pleasure to carry it about with me any longer nor could i ever leave it at a fitter time than this when i hoped that the better part of the world would perhaps think that by my misfortunes i had given a testimony of my integrity to my god my king and my country 
I thank God I count not the afflictions of the present life to be compared to that glory which is to be revealed in the time to come. My lords! My lords! My lords, something more I had intended to say, but my voice and my spirit fail me. Only I do in all humility and submission cast myself down at your lordship's feet, and desire that I may be a beacon to keep you from shipwreck. Do not put such rocks in your own way which no prudence, no circumspection can eschew or satisfy but by your utter ruin. And so, my lords, even so, with all tranquillity of mind, I submit myself to your decision. And whether your judgment in my case, I wish it were not the case of you all, be for life or for death, it shall be righteous in my eyes, and shall be received with a te deum laudamus. We give God the praise. End of section 9 Recording by Philip Gould